Um, welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us for this week's Small Business Essentials. Today's topic is Gig Workers 101. My name is TJ Daniels and I am the director of the Iowa Center's Women's Business Center. The Iowa Center's Women's Business Center is funded in part through a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Small Business Administration. You will receive an email after this event from my colleague, Sierra Smith, thanking you for attending today's session. Information on how to connect to our speaker, well, actually how to connect to me, as well as a form to complete. Please do us a big favor and take some time to fill this form out. This information allows us to continue providing free educational programming for small business owners in Iowa. Now go ahead and please take some time to locate the chat function on your Zoom screens so you can join the conversation by asking questions or adding comments. Also feel free to introduce yourself and your business in the chat and include your website or social media page so we can visit and learn more about your business and network. Now a little bit of information about today's speaker. Our speaker today is David Dye. David is a student of the class of 2023 at Grinnell College majoring in economics and political science, science with a statistics concentration. He has enjoyed working at um, the Iowa Center of Economic Success this summer as a microfinance intern. He has been working on loan projects and Salesforce projects. He is excited to share more information um, and tips for gig workers. David, the screen is now yours. Thank you. Welcome to today's webinar, Top Tips for Gig Workers. We're very glad that you're joining us today. I'm David Dye with the Iowa Center for Economic Success. As a reminder, the webinar will be recorded and posted to the Iowa Center's YouTube channel. You will also receive today's slide in your email. Now, before we get started, I do need to mention that this presentation is informational only. It is not intended to provide you with tax advice on your specific factual situation. Rather, the presentation is tending to provide you with general information about issues that arise in the gig economy. Now, during today's webinar, I will be discussing what is the gig economy, how does a gig worker know if, uh, if they are an employee or a self-employee. We'll talk about general tips for gig workers, business expenses, and uh, record, uh, record keeping for gig workers. We'll discuss the rules for home rental tax payment options for gig workers as well. So first, what is the gig economy? Well, if you use one of the many online platforms available to rent out a third bedroom, provide car rides, or connect with customers to provide other goods and services, you're involved in what is sometimes called the gig economy. It is also sometimes referred to as the on-demand sharing or uh, access economy. Gig economists, al uh, economies allow individuals and groups to use technology to arrange transactions that generate revenue for assets they possess, such as boats, homes, or uh, from services that they provide, such as rights, uh, household chores, or technology services. As um, Part of the gig economy, what you need to uh, remember is to keep track of your uh, time and cost. For gig workers, time is money. As a gig worker, you should always keep track of how you are spending your time and money. This helps you to build clients more easily and it can reveal you uh, the profitability in each area. For time tracking, there are a lot of apps that make it easy for you to track your time and money you spend working for various clients uh, or uh, on creating your product. So explore a little bit uh, to see what are those apps available to you. Also, you need to remember to build an emergency fund, save some for emergency. Salaried employees with stable income should set aside their money to cover at least three, ideally nine months of expenses in case of a financial emergency. As a gig worker though, your paychecks vary. You should consider covering nine to 12 months. The fund will give you a safety net if you are between projects or you face an unexpected expense. If you have dependents or fixed expenses like a mortgage or car payment aim for the higher end of the savings spectrum. You should also save for retirement. As a gig worker, saving for retirement is in your own hands. There will be not uh, matching funds to incentivize you. You have several options for retirement accounts, including an individual 401k, 
Roth 401k with Roth IRA. It is a good idea to schedule automatic transfers from your checking account to your retirement account to ensure your savings and investment plan stays on track. Just make sure you will have enough money each month to cover the transfer. Also consider contributing to your retirement accounts with uh, windfalls such as tax refunds or big client payments whenever you can. You also need to remember to protect yourself with insurance. Disability insurance can provide you with income you have, uh, if you have an accident or illness that prevents you from working. The income can keep you from going to debt to cover your basic expenses while you're laid up. Be sure to get a policy with an own occupation, uh, occupation rider. Without it, your insurance company may refuse to pay your benefit if it feels like you can still earn money outside of your current occupation. And that might be at a job that only pays minimum wage. On that note, health insurance is your responsibility too. Now, if you are a gig worker or self-employed, it helps to annually review all your insurance needs, ranging from life and homeowner's insurance to considering umbrella liability policy to make uh, sure there aren't gaps in your coverage. Now let's talk about tax. Just like any other job, money earned through the gig economy is taxable. Well, who can help? Uh, if you offer services in the gig economy, you must understand the potential tax issues that uh, may affect you. Many tax professionals can help, and the tax software industry is aware of this new business model. So many software programs are prepared to assist you with uh, preparing your taxes. Now, how can you treat the money? Um, well, we have to consider if you are an employee or you are an independent contractor. Well, if you are considered an employee, your employer must withhold income tax and your portion of the Social Security and Medicare taxes. Also, your employer is responsible for paying Social Security, Medicare, and employment taxes on your wages. Your employer must uh, give you a Form W-2 wage and tax statement showing the amount of taxes withheld from your pay. Uh, you may deduct and reimburse employee business expenses on Schedule A of your income tax return, but only if you itemize deductions and uh, they total uh, more than 2% of your adjusted gross income. Well, that's for if you are an employee. When you are an independent contractor though, the business may be required to give you form I one uh, form one o nine nine miscellaneous. That's a miscellaneous income form to report what it, uh, what it has paid to you. Uh, you are responsible for paying your own income tax and self employment tax. Um, the business does not withhold taxes uh, from your pay if you are independent contractor. You may need to make estimated tax payments during the year to cover your tax liabilities. Uh, you may deduct business expenses on Schedule C. Uh, of your income tax return. So how can we uh, uh, differentiate if we are considered self-employed or employee? Uh, generally, you're going to be considered self-employed if any of the following apply to you. You carry on a trade or business as a whole proprietor or an independent contractor or you're a member of a partnership that carries on a trade or business or you're otherwise in business for yourself. And that is, include part-time business as well. To decide whether the business you provide services for is exercising the type of control that could classify you as an employee, you need to look at these, cat these three categories. And those categories are here, behavioral control, financial control, and relationships. We'll get into each of those. So for behavioral control, uh, these facts, um, so uh, for example, uh, if the company uh, gives you instructions, uh, say if you receive extensive instructions on uh, how work uh, is to be done, this suggests that you are an employee. Uh, instruction can cover a wide range of topics, for example, how, when, or where to do the work, what tools or equipment to use, um, what assistance to hire to help with the work, where to purchase supplies and services. If you receive less extensive instructions, about what should be done, uh, but not how it should be done. You may be an independent contractor. For instance, instructions about time and place may be less important 
their uh, directions on how the work is performed. Training is also a factor into this uh, behavior control. If the business provides you with training about required procedures and methods, that indicates that a business wants the work done in a certain way. And this suggests that you may be an employee because that, uh, that's a very extensive um, instruction. Uh, it's behavior control. Now, the second category is financial control. These facts show whether there's a right to direct or control the business part of the work. For example, a significant investment. If you have a significant investment in your work, you may be an independent contractor. Uh, while there is no precise dollar test, the investment must have substance. Uh, however, a significant investment is not necessary to be an independent contractor. Expenses is another thing you should consider. If you are not reimbursed for some or all business expenses, then you may be an independent contractor, especially if your unreimbursed uh, un business expenses are very high. You might be an independent contractor. Another thing to consider is opportunity for profit or loss. If you can realize a profit or incur a loss, this suggests that you are in business for yourself and that you may be an independent contractor. Now, the last category to consider is relationship of the parties. Well, these are facts that illustrate how the business and the worker uh, perceive their relationship. For example, uh, employee benefits, that's something we can control. If you receive benefits such as insurance, pension, or paid leave, this is a good indication that you may be an employee. Uh, if you do not receive benefits, however, you could be either an employee or an independent contractor. Written contracts. A written contract may show uh, what both you and the business intend. Uh, this may be very significant if it's difficult, uh, if not possible to determine status based on other facts, which means uh, you, you really need to look into those facts. Uh, it's important for you to consider all the facts to determine whether you're an employee or independent contractor. If you're really not sure, you can complete and submit the form SS8, which is the determination of worker status for purposes of federal employment taxes and income tax withholding. That's a long name. That's the name of the form SS-8. Uh, you, you need to fill out that form and submit it to the IRS, and they will make a uh, official determination for you on your employment status. Now that's a lot. So uh, here's our first pop quiz. Uh, how do you determine if you are an independent contractor or employee? You can type your answer in the chat box or you can just unmute yourself and shout it out. I'll give you 30 seconds. All right, the correct answer is you look at behavior control, financial control, and type of relationship. That is C, you have to look at all those factors. Next section is responsibilities of the business operating the online platform. Well, if you are a small business owner involved in the gig economy, uh, if you have a company that offers a platform for gig workers, you need to determine if the people who provide services for you are employees or independent contractors. The business is equally responsible for determining whether it's hiring employees or independent contractors. This is a very important question for taxpayers who are paying others for providing their services in the gig economy. Before you can determine how to test payments, how to treat payments, that you make for services, you must, must first know the business relationship that exists between you and the person performing the services. To do that, the business owner needs to look at behavior control, financial control, and the type of relationship, the same categories. Now, if you determine that a gig worker is an independent contractor, um, if you make payments or non-employee compensation, you're going to use form 1099 miscellaneous to report the payment you made. Another form you need to know about is form uh, 1099-K. A company operating a digital platform might need to file this form. Uh, the title is payment card and third party network transactions. It's used by credit, company, credit card companies and third party processors like PayPal and Amazon to report the payment transactions that they process for rate dealers 
or other third parties. So if you operate a gig platform, you might need to issue form 1099-K to workers if you uh, um, possess uh, credit cards, debit cards, or prepaid cards in order to pay money to the gig workers. Now, if you determine that your workers are employees, employees need, uh, need, uh, need to pay wages uh, and withhold income tax and uh, social security and Medicare taxes. That's what you need to do for employees uh, if you determine that your workers are employees. To figure out how much tax to withhold, you use the employees uh, form W-4 that they filed uh, out and gave to you. And you use the method described on IRS publication 15. That's something to know. Uh, you can uh, look it up. The title is Employer's Tax Guide and Publication uh, 15-A, that's an employee supplemental tax guide. For details, you can uh, look those publications from IRS up. So here's a bit more detail on the kinds of taxes our employers uh, need to withhold and pay. Uh, there's federal income tax. Employees generally must withhold federal income tax uh, from uh, employees' wages. There's Social Security and Medicare taxes. Um, employees generally must withhold part of Social Security and Medicare taxes from uh, employees' wages as well. And then the employer uh, pays a matching amount. Employers use uh, Form 941, which is uh, employees' quarterly federal tax return, or Form 944, which is employees' annual federal tax return used to report federal income tax and Social Security and Medicare tax. And then there's federal unemployment tax, which is also known as the uh, FUTA tax, F-U-T-A. Um, employers report and pay this tax separately from federal income tax and separately from Social Security and Medicare taxes. You pay FUTA tax uh, only from your own funds, uh, from the business owner's funds. Uh, employee, employees, they do not uh, pay this tax and they don't have it withheld from their pay. To report FUTA as an employer, uh, you need to use Form 940, Employees Annual Federal Unemployment Tax Return. Employers need to deposit and report employee taxes. Um, uh, employer use a system called EFPPS to deposit employment taxes. Well, that system stands for Electronic uh, Federal Tax Payment System. Uh, you use that uh, system to deposit your uh, the employment taxes. Um, well, that's a lot for the uh, employer. If you run a small business um, and you hire gig uh, workers, that's what you need to know. So here's a pop quiz for you. And this is our second pop quiz. If a gig economy platform determines that its workers are employees, here it's employees, not uh, independent contractors. If you determine workers are employees, it is required to file the following forms. Which form is that? I'll give everybody 30 seconds. You can type it into the chat or you can shout it all out. All right, the correct answer is B, Form W2, Form 941, and Form 940. It's a good time to take notes uh, if you are uh, running a small business and you hire uh, gig workers and you consider them as employees, those are the forms that you have to file if they are not independent contractors, if they are employees for you. Okay, now let's get into uh, the next section. And this is about effects of classification on workers, business expenses. Well, if you are an employee, you cannot deduct your business expenses. However, if you are a gig worker, you determine that you are self-employed, you must be able to deduct certain business expenses. And a few of those are listed on, um, uh, on the resource that I will be giving you. For example, if you are in uh, the ride share business, you might be able to deduct expenses from uh, supplies, cell phones, uh, auto expenses, food and drinks for passengers, car washes, parking fees, posts, roadside assistance plans, taxes, and incentives uh, associated with certain electric and the hybrid vehicle. All those you can put in your uh, deduction as business expenses. However, you need to be sure and keep good records separating the cost from those items that you use from business and those that you, are, uh, that you use personally 
because generally you cannot deduct personal living or family expenses. So a very important thing to remember as a gig worker is you have to keep good records and includes your money transactions, uh, your expenses, that includes your cost, uh, other expenses, and also your time, like I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the presentation. Keeping good records is really important to gig workers. You want to choose a uh, record uh, keeping system that is suited to your business and that clearly shows your income and expenses. The business that you are in is going to affect types of records that you need to keep for federal tax purposes. And your record keeping system should include a summary of all of your business transactions. You need to show your gross income as well as your deductions and your credits. Federal law sets statutes of limitations that can affect how long you need to keep tax records. Now, generally, there are three years from the time you filed your return. However, in certain situations, you may be required to keep your business and tax records longer than three years. Next is the self-employment tax deduction. Well, you can deduct the employer equivalent portion of your self-employment tax in figure out your adjusted gross income. Um, this deduction only affects your income tax. It does not affect either your net earnings for self-employment or your self-employment tax. Well, this uh, self-employment health insurance tax deduction, for example, under uh, section 2042 uh, of the Small Business uh, Jobs Act, a deduction for income tax purposes is allowed to self-employed individuals for the cost of health insurance. Uh, these, uh, this deduction is taken into account in calculating net earnings from self-employment. So you have to research all the tax re uh, deductions if you're self-employed and report those. How do you treat income? Uh, well, if I'm working as a gig, gig worker, I have income. And gig economy income, just like any other income, um, it's taxable. You must report the income earned from the gig economy on a tax return. Even if it's just a part-time, temporary, or side work, income, uh, it's taxable, even if it's paid in cash, property, or virtual currency, which brings it back to you have to keep a good uh, record. You have to keep record uh, if you receive your income in whichever form, in virtual currency, property, cash, all those. If you're an employee, wages are usually going to be reported on a uh, Form W-2, uh, but if you're self-employed, you need to be sure and keep track of the business income that you receive. Uh, and gig workers might do work through multiple businesses or platforms. And it's very important to keep track of all of your income uh, throughout all the platforms. You might not receive an information return that includes all of your business income. It's your own responsibility to keep all those records. Several information return forms to highlight. There is another note keeping, uh, note taking time. There's form 1099 miscellaneous, also called that 109. Uh, well, that's used uh, to report miscellaneous income, such as non-employee compensation. And there's also a form 1099-K. Uh, that form is used to report third-party transactions, such as those made through a payment card, like a credit card. Now, the business that you um, work with, uh, with, they may uh, send forms to the RS to uh, report payments to you. If they do, you should receive copies of the forms by January 31st. And uh, that would be things like form uh, 109-K and the uh, 10, uh, well, form 1099-K and the 1099 miscellaneous and the W-2 that we just talked about. You want to keep your uh, use, uh, use your uh, sales receipts to report any payments that were not reported to you on either Form 1099 or W-2. Remember, business income is taxable, even if it's not reported on an information return. Okay, the self-employed and independent uh, contract workers are taxed differently than employees, if you already noticed, right? If you are an employee, in uh, addition to income tax, you pay social security and Medicare taxes, and your employer pays a matching amount of uh, social security and Medicare tax. On the other hand, though, uh, as a self-employed person, uh, you pay an amount equal to what an employee uh, would pay in addition to what an employee uh, actually 
uh, pays, but you are allowed to a deduction for half of that tax payment. And this is all worked out on Schedule SE, self-employment tax. That is um, attached to your individual tax return form 1040. But before you determine if you are subject to self-employment tax and income tax, you must subtract your business expenses from your business income. If your expenses are less than your income, the difference is net profit. It becomes part of your income on form 1040. If your expenses are more than your income, the difference is a net loss. You may be able to deduct your loss from gross income on form 1040, but in some situations, uh, your loss is limited. Uh, you can read, for more information, you can read publication 334, Tax Guide for Small Businesses, and that's for individuals who use the Schedule C. There has more, there has more uh, information on business income, expenses, and when a loss is deductible. You have to file an income tax return. If your net earnings from self-employment are $400 or more, if your net earnings from self-employment are less than $400, you still have to file an income tax return if you meet any other filing requirements listed in the instructions uh, for form, uh, from form uh, 1040. That's your US individual income tax. So, well, a general rule is that if, if you're over $400, then you are gonna file. Uh, but if you're under $400, you can read up the form uh, and uh, look at the detailed instructions. Well, to emphasize, if you're self-employed, you must pay as you go, not only for your income tax, as was discussed before, but also for the self-employment tax, the SE tax that I just mentioned. Now we talked about other liabilities that you have to pay. Uh, well, how do you pay? That's a big question. Well, pay as you go, means you should have paid the majority of your tax liability at the time your tax returns due, or you may incur a penalty. You need to file an annual return and pay estimated tax quarterly. That's something you have to remember. You have to file an annual return and pay estimated tax quarterly. Employees are usually going to satisfy this requirement through their paycheck withholding. If you're involved in the gig economy and you don't have taxes withheld from your income, you might want to make estimated tax payment during the year uh, to cover your tax obligations. Estimated payments are due on April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and January 15th of the following year. You can use the form 1040-ES estimated tax for individuals to figure out and to report the amount of these payments. But the fastest and easiest way to make the estimated tax payment is actually electronically. Uh, you can use IRS Direct Pay, uh, where you can use the Treasury Department's Electronic Federal Tax Payments uh, System. It's also known as the EFTPS that we mentioned before. Uh, now you may also want to make estimated tax payments to help avoid penalties if the amount of uh, income tax withholding from your salary, pension, or other income is not enough to cover your taxes for the year, or you can help cover your taxes by filing out and submitting a new form, a W-4, and that form is Employees Withholding Allowance Certificate. If you have other jobs where you work as an employee, you will have, uh, you'll have them uh, withhold more money to cover your income that doesn't have withholding. Well, a paycheck checkup using the IRS withholding estimator can help you. Uh, see if you should make additional payments to avoid an unexpected tax bill or an underpayment penalty when you file your tax return. Okay, well, tax, uh, estimated tax is the method uh, used to pay Social Security and Medicare taxes and income tax because you do not have any for you withholding their taxes for you. You have to make estimated tax payments if they expect your old tax of a thousand dollars or more when their return is filed and you have to use uh, form 1040-ES. You will need your prior year's annual tax return in order to fill out. Uh, if it is your first year being self-employed, so you, you will need to estimate the amount of income you expect to earn for the year. 
Uh, if you estimate that your earnings too high, simply complete another form, and that form is 1040-ES. Uh, and then you can refigure out your estimated tax for the next quarter. If you estimate your uh, earnings too low, again, use the same form, and then you can recalculate your estimated taxes for the next quarter. Okay, that's a lot of uh, tax materials and forms to cover. So let's refresh our memory a little bit, and now let's look at our third pop quiz. Now, if you are a gig worker, right? If a gig worker is liable for income tax and self-employment tax, what options does the gig worker have to pay those taxes? A, IRS direct pay, B, EFTPS, the electronic system I mentioned earlier, C, form 1040-ES, D, increase uh, withholdings on their wage income using form W4, E, any of the above. I give everybody some time. You can text, uh, you can uh, type it in a chat box or you can shout it all out if you wish. Okay, well, the correct answer, uh, the correct answer is E, any of the above. All those methods are available to you to pay your taxes as a self-employee to get working. Now let's get into a, a brand new section that is home rentals. Uh, a lot of gig workers, they uh, feel the need of uh, uh, put this section separately because um, things like Airbnb, uh, that gig workers are involved in, that's uh, home rental. So what should people with home rentals do? Okay, if you received rental income for the use of a house or your apartment or your vacation home, you must usually report it on your tax return as well. As you already guessed probably, you can deduct certain expenses. These deductible expenses reduce the amount of rental income subject to tax. And these expenses could include uh, mortgage interest, real estate taxes, casualty losses, maintenance, utilities, insurance, and depreciation. If you use a dwelling unit for both rental and personal purposes, you generally must divide your total expenses between the rental use and the personal use based on the number of days used for each purpose. And you won't be able to deduct your rental expenses in excess of the gross rental income limitation. Well, there's a special rule if you use a dwelling unit as a personal residence and you're, you rent it for uh, fewer than 15 days. So if you rent your uh, personal residence uh, less than 15 days, it's a, there will be special rule applied to you. If it's less than 15 days, you do not uh, report any of the rental income and you don't deduct any other rental expenses. Normally rental home and expenses are reported on form 1040 schedule E, supplemental income and loss. But if you provide uh, substantial services and we're talking about hotel-like services in, conjun in conjunction to the property, then you use form 1040 schedule C, profit or loss for business or partnership or cooperation return if your business is set up that way. Uh, examples of substantial services include, uh, say, maid service, regular cleaning and changing the linens. So those services will be additional services, um, uh, any extra to the property rental. And uh, please note that uh, substantial services don't include things like just the heat and light that you provide in the rental place or cleaning of public areas or trash collection, those are not part of additional service, services um, uh, in extra to renting the property. So for more information on this, you can find RS topic 415, uh, renting residential and a vacation property, and also publication 527, residential rental property, including rental and vacation home. That's the title of the publication and the topic from IRS. So I mentioned earlier that you can uh, deduct your depreciation, but what exactly is that? Well, uh, independent contractors may be able to deduct business expenses and depreciate, depreciation as an example of a business expense. So if you are a gig worker, you wonder depreciation, um, how can I consider what is depreciation and what is not? Well, uh, depreciation is an uh, annual income tax deduction that allows you to recover the cost or other basis of certain property over the time you use the property. 
Uh, it's an allowance for the wear and tear, a uh, deterioration, or um, so basically if your property breaks down, things like that, uh, you add in more mileage into your car, that's depreciation. The kinds of property you can depreciate uh, include uh, machinery, equipment, buildings, vehicles, and furniture. You cannot claim depreciation on property held only for personal purposes. If you use property, for example, a car for both business and personal purposes, you can depreciate only the business use of that asset. You need to keep records, again, I cannot stress this enough. You need to keep records that separate the business use for the, uh, from the personal use. So, you know, so far we have uh, stressed on keeping records for money, for time, and also uh, if you have a car, you have to keep records on the mileage you used for personal use and business use. You really need to keep good records as a good worker. Well, you can depreciate property uh, that meets all the following requirements. Here is a clear list that uh, I put on a slide that you can either take notes or remember. Um, the property, it, it must be something that you own. That's the first uh, requirement. It must be used in a business or income pro a producing activity. It must be used, like I said earlier, uh, by a business, not by personal use. Well, it, may, uh, it must have a determinable use for life. Um, you know, a washing machine for how many years it will break down a car for how many mileage, it, it, must, it must have a determinable useful life. It also must be expected to last more than one year. Uh, anything uh, that will perish within one year, uh, you cannot uh, put it as depreciation. It also must not be accepted property. And what are the accept, uh, accepted properties? You can find those on IRS publication 946, how to depreciate property. That's an important form to see all the exceptions of properties that you can depreciate. Depreciation begins with a tax, uh, with the taxpayer places property in service for use in a trade or business or for the production of income. The property ceases to be depreciable when the taxpayer has fully recovered the property's cost on uh, other basis. Or when the taxpayer retires uh, the property from service, whichever happens first, uh, then after that, the property uh, cannot be further depreciated. Okay, now about the final section we just covered, it's uh, our final pop quiz. What is the rule when you rent out your home for fewer than 15 days? A, don't report any of the rental income and don't deduct any expenses. B, report the income and expenses on Form 1065 for partnerships. C, report the income expenses, including depreciation. D, there are no special rules based on the number of days you rent out your home. I'll let you think for several seconds. You can um, type in the answer in the group chat or you can shout it all out or review the answer in a bit. Okay, for well, this one, the correct answer is A. If you prop, if you rent out your personal uh, home for less than fifteen days, then you do not uh, need to report any of the rental income and don't deduct any expenses. So basically, if you rent out your home less than fifteen days, don't care about it. It's fine. You don't need to file anything for it. Okay, we covered a lot today uh, for gig workers, and that wraps up all the information that I've prepared for you. And if you have questions, now's the time. Let's see, I'm not seeing any questions in chat. Well, thank you everybody for attending this webinar and I'll give uh, the screen back to DJ. Perfect, thank you, David. Um, of course, at the end of each session, I always ask the speaker, what is the one piece of information you hope everyone takes away from the um, presentation? Well, as I mentioned in this presentation, um, I cannot stress one thing enough and I hope that you have that in your mind already and that is keeping your records. 
You need to keep your records as a gig worker, uh, how much time you spend, uh, your expenses in different uh, things, you know, your gas if you're driving a car, all the costs and expenses. And also you need to keep track of which part you're using for uh, the gig work and which part you're using for personal use. Those are very important to file tax return uh, to do depreciation, like I mentioned earlier, and also to like bill clients and track your profitability and all that. So one piece of information you have to remember, keep good records. And file taxes if you make more than $400. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, David, for taking your time um, to share such valuable information with the audience. And thank you to the audience for being here, engaging and um, asking questions. I also wanted to take a minute to share some information. Um, on Monday, we started our Financially Savvy series, which is all things financials, um, QuickBooks, financial documents, et cetera. There's still time to join. So if you would like to join, um, please email me and I will send you a coupon code to um, join. We record each session. Um, this Thursday session is Financial Documents 101. Um, with that, I will leave us all with my one piece of information for everyone, and that is to love what you do and do what you love. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.